from New York to our viewers worldwide. I'm Romain Bostic in for Jonathan Farrow today. Bloomberg Real Yield, it starts right now. Coming up, markets on edge following that stunning inflation print earlier this week, sparking fears of an even more aggressive Federal Reserve, sending short end yields surging higher. But we begin with the big issue, a look ahead to Wednesday and Fed Chair Jay Powell. The U.S. inflation number was horrific. No, it's, a, it's a little warmer than expected. Rental price inflation remains very, very hot. There are just a few hot spots. The Fed isn't going to blink. The Fed's going to go 75 basis points. The hot core CPI print that we saw on Tuesday. It puts the Fed into overdrive. 100 basis points is still on the table. If they're in overdrive, sooner or later they're going to make a policy mistake. Central bankers do not understand money. They are feeling their way to how far they have to raise. That number is going up, of course. Tell me the last time the Federal Reserve got it correct. The Fed will now have more of reason to go 75 basis points uh, next week. Some of the voices we heard this week, of course, after that stunning inflation print, joining us right now to talk a little bit more about that and what to expect in the week ahead. Bank of America's Mark Cabana joining us right now. And Mark, let's start off here with how surprised were you not only by the inflation print, but more importantly, by the market reaction to it? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, we were surprised by the inflation print. We thought that inflation, both in services uh, and goods, were going to be on a downward trajectory. And what we saw is that they're both remaining persistently and stubbornly elevated. Um, that is true, again, on the goods side and on the services side, especially with that alarming OER print or owner's equivalent uh, rent print that we saw. And as a result, it clearly means that the Fed has to do more. Now, we were not terribly surprised by the market reaction. We thought that the market reaction was very reasonable given the magnitude of the inflation surprise and given what it means for the general direction of the Fed. And look, the Fed has to keep going. The concern here is that the Fed doesn't really know how far they have to go. Their well, forecasts have likely been challenged, just yeah. like many uh, private forecasters have been challenged. And they're going to likely keep going until something breaks. Well, but, that raises the risks that they ultimately overdo it. Right. And of course, I mean, the real conversation right now, Mark, is how far do they have to go? When do we reach that breaking point? Does Powell actually really believe in this idea of a soft landing? We heard from the folks over at Deutsche Bank and a lot of other shops around the street this week talking about about what that potential terminal rate can be, putting it somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.5%, some going even higher than that. Where do you see it going? Yeah, so the B of A house view is that the top of the range will be four and a quarter, so 4.25%. But we acknowledge that the risks are skewed to the upside, given the strength that we're seeing both on the inflation data and also in the labor market. And as long as these two variables both remain quite strong and quite elevated, then the Fed is going to probably have to keep going. Now, again, the risk here is that the Fed is just reacting to the data that they see right in front of them. They've probably lost their confidence to have a high degree of conviction in where inflation and where the labor market is likely going. That means that they're reactionary, and that increases the risk that they will likely go too far. But given where the labor market and inflation are right now, both pointing to signs of imbalance, the Fed knows that they have to err on that risk. And uh, if it means going too far, then so be it, because they know they've got to get inflation under control. In conversation right now with Mark Cabana, Bank of America Securities, head of U.S. rate strategy. Anybody, of course, who watches Bloomberg Real Yields no normally knows that we have three guests, but, of course, the ghost of John Farrell causing some technical difficulties. I'm pleased to say uh, our second guest is now with us, Maureen O'Connor, joining us right now, Wells Fargo Global Head of High Grade Debt uh, Syndicate, and, of course, Mark Cabana still sticking with us. Maureen, let's pick up uh, where uh, Mark left off here. Uh, give us a sense here of where you sort of model where the Fed can end, and more importantly, can they end in a place that doesn't cause, I guess, that proverbial economic destruction? Um, I mean, I, I think I agree um, with um, the points that Mark was making. I think that the, the needle that the Fed uh, has to thread here has grown increasingly fine, um, and the likelihood that they're going to be able to orchestrate a soft landing here, I think, is sort of a, a fleeting hope at this point. Um, so we do price in the likelihood that we are going to be looking at, um, you know, some stronger recessionary headwinds as we head into 2023. 
Um, you know, again, uh, we have a, a stubbornly high inflation problem. The Fed is going to have to continue on this path of very aggressive rate hikes and aggressive balance sheet unwind. Um, and that's going to be a drag on all risk assets. Obviously, you saw the market reaction to the CPI print um, on uh, Tuesday of this week. Um, but we continue to see headwinds um, abound. And that will be um, impactful to both equity markets as, all, as, well, as, uh, as well as credit product like uh, I operate in an investment grade. I'm curious, Maureen, are you paying closer attention to some of the moves in rate in and of itself, or are you also paying attention to some of the movements and I guess some of the ripple effects from quantitative tightening? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the two are sort of married, right? Um, the Fed is draining liquidity from the system, and that's putting upward pressure on Treasury yields. And as Treasury yields have ratcheted higher and fixed income returns have become more deeply negative, um, we've seen an acceleration of outflows from you know, credit funds, and that's put pressure on spreads. Um, so I think the two are, are interconnected, right? Um, you know, arguably the one uh, area that hasn't gotten a lot of uh, attention is quantitative tightening. And I think, um, you know, as the Fed continues on this path of accelerated rate hikes, the question then becomes at what point do they need to maybe start uh, pressing a little bit harder on that pedal on, uh, on quantitative tightening. We think that could be the next shoe to drop here. So no question that the Fed is working against us here. That will be um, a drag on equity markets. It will be a drag on credit product as well. How much stability is there right now, Mark, in the markets to withstand, uh, I guess, this test the Fed is sort of putting up against it? Yeah, well, so we've seen market liquidity and market depth really thin um, in, a, in a notable way. We certainly see that in the Treasury space, and we see that across other markets as well. That's partially due to macro uncertainty. None of us really know how far the Fed is going to have to go. None of us really know what the path of inflation will be. But it is also due to just a lot of debt that needs to get moved around, a lot of risk that needs to get transferred, and a dealer community that is somewhat constrained by the regulatory backdrop. Um, and that does create some concerns when you start thinking about well, would the Fed speed up QT? Would they consider mortgage sales? Because they would, doing so, they would be doing so in a marketplace that is underlying fragility, that gives us signs of concern, at least here at B of A Research. When we talk about what the Fed will do, or at least what a lot of people think they should do, Maureen, a lot of talk about that 75 basis points that Powell has telegraphed, the potential, I guess, in some corners of the market that we could see 100 basis points. And then, of course, you have the contrarian view that maybe the Fed should just do 25 and pause. Where do you stand? Uh, well, our in-house call here at Wells Fargo is that um, they will move 75 at next week's meeting. Um, but the market has opened a window for something perhaps a little bit more aggressive. Um, but we, we're calling for 75. I think the bigger question is what happens now at the November meeting. And I think certainly the, the, the groundwork has been laid for perhaps another 75 basis point hike uh, at, the, at the subsequent meeting. Has so, sort of the ructions that we've seen in the market, has this made your job harder, uh, Maureen, right now? Or are you seeing opportunity out there? Uh, well, so, um, you know, my function is really advising issuers of debt capital, and there's no question that, you know, this year has been a very tough market environment to navigate. Um, but I think, you know, one of the positives, at least with respect to investment grade, is that the primary market has remained pretty open throughout this year. Yes, there have been some periods of, of market volatility where we've seen supply kind of dwindle a little bit, but we have priced a trillion dollars of supply. The market is still wide open, despite the fact that we are sustaining some pretty meaningful total return losses in investment grade as an asset class. And we have sustained um, some record-breaking outflows uh, in terms of ETF and mutual fund flows. But all the while, we're still in the early part of the cycle here, right? Fundamentals are still reasonably intact, and we still have a community of in institutional buyers, um, particularly our liability-driven investor base, insurance companies and pension funds, for example, you know, who have been enthusiastically buying credit at these new higher yields. That's really supported our market. So yes, the job yeah. gets uh, a little bit trickier, you know, hand-holding, um, but our market has stayed pretty open and operational throughout. All right, I want to dive a little bit uh, deeper into some of the, uh, the, the yields that we've seen and the spreads that we've been seeing in the credit space in just a minute uh, with Maureen. But, Mark, I, I want to go back to you here, and specifically if you can address some of the issues with the amount of cash that we've seen, I guess, looking for a home or, I don't know, maybe it's not looking for a home. <laughs> Yeah, so we still do think that there is uh, a large amount of liquidity in the system. Certainly seems like an excess amount of liquidity. And we do see that, at least in the Treasury market that I'm most familiar with, there are a couple of areas on the curve where there are supply-demand imbalances. At the very front end of the curve, you are seeing demand overwhelm supply. And that's causing front-end Treasuries to be very, very rich. It's caused a lot of cash to be parked in the Fed's overnight reverse repo facility, somewhat sitting on the sidelines. Um, 
and, and there's a bit of a bit of supply demand imbalance there. Now, out the curve in the Treasury market, you have somewhat the opposite issue. There is too much supply and not enough demand. And you have seen very sharp movements, um, certainly out the curve. You've seen the 20 year point in particular be somewhat dislocated from the 10 and 30 year parts of the Treasury curve. And that does give us some signs of concern because elevated volatility at the back end of the curve, elevated duration risk, and illiquidity at the back end of the curve does help tighten financial conditions. And that can have ripple effects throughout the system that can spill over to mortgages. It could potentially spill over to credit. And that is certainly something that we're watching. But today, where we see the greatest uh, supply and demand imbalance in terms of the cash that's in the system, we really do see that at the front end of the rates curve. And it's really a bunch of investors that we think are trying to hide out, knowing that the Fed is moving aggressively, mm -hmm. which makes them not really want to own duration risk, but also seeing that there's probably going to be a slowdown ahead. Yeah. Um, and that's making them somewhat cautious from owning risk. All right, so tight for one second in conversation with Mark Cabana, of course, over at B of A Securities, and Maureen O'Connor, of course, Wells Fargo Global Head of the High Grade Debt Syndicate over there. I want to get some more insights out of her about that debt syndicate. Up next, the auction block. Corporate bond sales going a little bit cold here after that hotter than expected inflation print. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Romain Bostic here in for Jonathan Farrow. Time now for the auction block where we're going to kick things off with what's happening in Europe. With companies and governments flooding the primary market, total debt sales topping 64 billion euros in the busiest week since March. Back here in the United States, the long-awaited Citrix bond sale kicking off this week, but there were some hiccups following that upside surprise in those CPI numbers. And volatility spooking blue chip borrowers into holding back some debt sales, high grade volume falling 50% short of weekly projections. Sticking with credit, we did hear a little bit earlier this week from JP Morgan's Oksana Aronov issuing a warning for credit markets. Listen. I know that sort of the preferred mantra out there, as, at least as it relates to credit, is that, oh, you know, the maturity wall is still out there. It's not kind of breathing down anyone's neck. As stress continues to make its way through fundamentals, through profit margins, right. and we're starting to see some of that stress, we're going to continue to see now the credit hey. market start to catch up to the reality. Okay, Still with us, Mark Cabana over at B of A, Maureen O'Connor over at Wells. Uh, Maureen, let's start off here uh, with, I guess, where we started off this month. There was a lot of activity uh, at the start of the month with regards to new issuance, and that cooled pretty significantly uh, over the last week. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, um, listen, I, I think September was always set up to underwhelm a little bit supply wise. And I think part of that goes back to the idea that August surprised to the upside in terms of supply. You'll remember in early August, Treasury yields were a good 65, 70 basis points lower than they are right now. Um, and investment grade credit spreads at the index level were 10 or 15 basis points tighter. So if you were a borrower and you had a funding need in the second half of the year, that early August window looked like a pretty opportune time to come. And so we had a really big issue in month in August, 115 billion, second largest month on record for, for August. So I think some of that stole from the September window. Um, September historically is a very busy month for us, and you saw us come right after that Labor Day weekend with a huge amount of supply on that Tuesday, 35 billion in a single day across 19 transactions. But this month was always going to be front loaded. You had CPI and you have the Fed data next week, yeah. all of which I think was encouraging our borrowers to de-risk their trades early on. So we do think the calendar is set to underwhelm here for the balance of the month and really for the, the fourth quarter as well. The fourth quarter, do you not think, do you think that we'll actually see some issuers maybe try to get ahead under the assumption that the Fed does continue, as Mark pointed to, Maureen, do you think that we could see some issuers maybe try to get in front of that? Yeah, I mean, the fourth quarter is actually a little bit tricky to navigate in that you do tend to have kind of classic closed periods around Q3 earnings in October. So really, the next window for supply comes in late October, early November. And this year, we'll obviously be contending with the midterm elections around that time. Um, so, you know, it, it will be, I think, narrow windows of opportunity to get something done between now and year end. But to the extent that market conditions remain favorable, and perhaps if we do see a little bit of relief on the Treasury yield front, you might get a little bit of pull forward from the 2023 calendar. Um, but again, the Maturity towers next year are pretty manageable, and mm -hmm. in the absence of, you know, let's say a big M&A pipeline, we just don't see the fourth quarter su surprising to the upside in terms of overall issuance volumes. Mark, how do you feel about that? 
So uh, I'll defer to Maureen in terms of her expertise in the credit market, um, but I would say that that's going to probably, if, if the pipeline does slow down a little bit, that's going to be a net positive for financial conditions. We do think that financial conditions are going to be challenged on a go-forward basis. Again, the Fed is hiking aggressively, markets have been volatile, it's very difficult to have confidence in what the journey or the path towards lower inflation and a slower economy will be, and we're concerned that you're going to likely see signs that the economy is beginning to slow. The labor market will begin to soften. We don't know exactly when that will happen, but we're very confident that the Fed will ensure that that outcome is realized. And that's going to probably mean that earnings forecasts get revised lower. We all saw what happened with FedEx mm -hmm. in the last day or so. Um, and we do think that you're going to see more of those types of changes. And net-net, that's going to serve to further tighten financial conditions. So it may be a bit of a positive if the credit issuance pipeline slows down a little bit or is not as aggressive. That will certainly help offset what we expect to be still a further tightening of financial conditions in the future. All right, I'm going to have to leave it there. Uh, always wonderful to catch up with both of you. Mark Cabana over at Bank of America, Maureen O'Connor over at Wells Fargo. Still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead coming up, featuring a host of global rate decisions, including the Federal Reserve. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Real Yield. Romain Bostic here in for Jonathan Farrell. Time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up, a host of global rate decisions taking center stage. Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve kicking things off on Wednesday with that big decision. Then it's the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England on Thursday. Plus, we get another round of initial jobless claims. And finally, we're going to round out the week with some new PMIs, Europe and the U.S., manufacturing and services. A lot to chew on here. Let's bring in our next guest and get his thoughts on what's ahead. Gershon Distenfeld joining us right now over at Alliance Bernstein. Gershon, glad we could get you on the program. Uh, before we end it here, uh, let's start off here uh, with that kind of look ahead. We're all kind of expecting that 75 basis points out of the Fed here. Do you have any sense here, any hope here that maybe that could be it? Well, it, it for that day, or I think we'll get another <laughs> big hike in November. Um, you know, I think 100 basis points is on the table. But to me, much more important than whether it's 75 or 100 in the day, 25 in actuality, the real economy is a rounding error. Much more important is, you know, the, the statement that comes with it. And I, I think this week's number was a game changer in that it reminded me very much of the number, I think it was November of last year, where it became clear that inflation wasn't transitory. I think this time it's now become clear that we haven't really made a dent in the problem yet. And that means the Fed's going to have to be much more aggressive. Yeah. I think investors are going to be looking towards how much more they're going to have to hike in the coming months. And we've actually seen the market reaction to that. A huge surge in two-year yields this week, more than 30 basis points, and a deeper inversion across the curve here. When you look at some of the uh, inverted parts of the curve uh, and what it's signaling, particularly when it comes to those higher uh, two-year yields and, I guess, relatively flat yields looking further out in the 10, 20, and 30-year space here, does that mean the recession is already priced in? Well, it's always hard to know what exactly is priced in. It really depends on how deep it is. It very well could be. I think the interesting thing this week to, is that, or in the past couple of weeks, that the real curve started to invert, not just a nominal curve. And that should further tell you that, you know, recession, or I hate using the word recession, I'm, you know, it could mean very, very, very different things. And the question is, is it priced into markets? Very interesting reaction this week, right? The equity markets took it very hard. The credit markets did not. Mm -hmm. I, I think it speaks to the fact that the, there has not been the kinds of excesses in the credit markets over the past couple of years that we've seen prior to going into previous downturns. But, you know, the jury is still out on that. And we've seen that reflected in spreads, though. When you look at some of those spreads and you look at, I guess, the relative stability that we've been seeing there, does that provide opportunity for investors right now or should that be something to worry about? Well, it's very hard to call, call the bottom, but just given that you know, we only we're coming out of COVID from two years ago, where it really scared the, the, the daylights out of companies. And they haven't really been over the past couple of years in mass taking advantage of, of leveraging opportunities. Hasn't been a ton of M&A, haven't been spending a ton on, on cash buybacks, uh, sorry, stock buybacks and ramping up capital expenditures. 
We had a default cycle a couple of years ago. So again, I can't say spreads aren't going to go wider. There may still be a better opportunity. But I think that investors dipping their toes into the market today, when they look back two or three years from now, it's very unlikely that we're going to see the kind of defaults and losses that are going to wipe away that extra spread. We've spent the past 20 minutes uh, focused he heavily uh, on the United States. I'm wondering if you can take us global here, Gershon, particularly when it comes to Europe and the inflation challenges that they have over there, and I guess any potential opportunities uh, for fixed income investors in that part of the world. Yeah, it's interesting, Roman. You 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 mentioned are we is it priced in? I think a lot more is actually priced into Europe, and, and particularly in the credit markets, where credit quality just you know like for like versus the U.S. market is quite a bit higher. There's less cyclicality, uh, just very very few triple C's. So you know, especially with the amount you can pick up as a U.S. investor from just hedging the euro back to the dollar, you're looking at hedged yields higher than in the U.S. for better credit quality. Not going to be pretty in the short run. There's a very big problem there. You saw the UK trying to address this week uh, the, the energy price thing. You're going to see more of that. Um, and the ECB is going to have to hike a heck of a lot more than they were thinking certainly six or 12 months ago. So it's going to be a bumpy ride. But for longer term investors, I think there's actually more opportunity in Europe than there is in the US. And just real quickly, only about a minute left here. What about Asia, particularly when it comes to Japan? Uh, the, the question here is, is are we out of the 40-year cycle of Japan or not? And I think the, the, the jury's still out on that one. I don't think we have a strong view on Japan. Of course, credit in Japan is very focused on the banking sector. It's not nearly as diversified. So it's not something that we are, are recommending that people you know, go heavy into at this point. All right, Gershon, really uh, glad that we can get you here on the show. Always wonderful insights. Uh, Gershon Distenfeld, Alliance Bernstein, co-head of Fixed Income. And, of course, our thanks to Mark Cabana, as well as Maureen O'Connor. That pretty much wraps it up here uh, for Bloomberg Real Yield here in New York. Jonathan Farrell will be back next week, assuming Tom Keene gives him his passport back. This is Bloomberg.